One step to the moon. This seemingly inspirational phrase reflects an ambition that many organizations have envisioned, yet none have successfully achieved. The concept has been discussed and analyzed for decades, but it has never progressed beyond theory into practical execution. Now that idea is being revisited through the immense potential of SpaceX's Starship. At the same time, an important question naturally arises. Does Starship not require multiple refueling operations to complete long-distance missions? If so, how does SpaceX plan to upgrade Starship to enable a direct journey to the moon? The answer leads us to a bold and ambitious concept known as Nova Star. Starship. That possibility matters because history is not standing still. The United States won the moon race in the last century, and that achievement is widely recognized across the world. However, the historic victory does not mean the current race can be dismissed or treated as a closed chapter. Today's competition is fundamentally different from the one that defined the Apollo era. This is no longer a race focused on short visits, symbolic gestures, or rapid returns to Earth. Instead, it is a race centered on long-term settlement, sustained operations, and the creation of a permanent human presence beyond our planet. That change in purpose transforms both the challenge and the stakes involved. Because of this shift, surpassing rivals remains critically important. Particularly China, and arriving earlier, carries immense strategic, technological, and geopolitical significance. Equally important is how humanity chooses to get there. The mission architecture selected today will directly shape what becomes possible tomorrow, including how quickly infrastructure can be built, how frequently crews can rotate, how much cargo can be delivered, and how sustainable lunar operations can ultimately become. Looking back, the Apollo missions relied on a carefully structured multi-phase approach. The crewed command module and the lunar lander were launched together, followed by separation, descent, ascent, and rendezvous operations in lunar orbit. Crews transferred between spacecraft before landing on the moon and again after returning to orbit. This method, known as lunar orbit rendezvous, was a remarkable solution given the technological limitations of the time. Despite dramatic advances in computing, propulsion, materials, and automation, modern crewed lunar programs have not fundamentally escaped this multi-phase structure. NASA's Artemis program provides a clear example. Artemis still depends on two major launches for each crewed landing mission. The Space Launch System, or SLS for short, carries the Orion spacecraft and its crew, while the lunar lander is launched separately by a commercial partner. These landers include SpaceX's Starship HLS, or Human Landing System, derived from Starship, and Blue Origin's Blue Moon Lander, which will fly aboard New Glenn. In this architecture, crews must still perform vehicle transfers in lunar orbit, repeating a process that closely resembles Apollo-era operations. On top of this, Starship's sheer size requires multiple refueling operations in Earth orbit before it can continue onward to the moon. China follows a similar philosophy. Its planned crewed lunar missions also rely on at least two launches. Launches. Two Long March 10 rockets will separately deliver a crewed spacecraft and a lunar lander. Once again, rendezvous and crew transfers occur in lunar orbit, introducing the same operational complexities seen in Western programs. At first glance, this approach appears logical. Dividing a mission into multiple specialized stages allows each vehicle to focus on a specific role. In theory, this improves redundancy and increases reliability. In practice, however, this architecture introduces several serious drawbacks. First, every additional phase increases overall complexity. More complexity does not automatically reduce risk. In many cases, it amplifies it. Each rendezvous requires precise navigation, flawless communication, and perfect timing. Each crew transfer introduces another point where failure could jeopardize the mission. Orbital refueling systems add even more uncertainty. Starship's refueling concept, while innovative, has faced criticism due to the number of launches required within a narrow time window the need for repeated docking operations, and the difficulty of storing cryogenic propellants in space without excessive boil-off. Second, multi-phase missions require tight coordination across multiple vehicles, contractors, and organizations. This level of coordination must be exact. Small errors in scheduling, integration, or execution can cascade into major problems. Third, cost becomes a dominant concern. Artemis illustrates this clearly. NASA has spent tens of billions 
millions of dollars developing the SLS, Orion, Mobile Launch Infrastructure, and Associated Ground Systems. Additional contracts are required for commercial landers, each with its own development risks and timelines. Cost overruns and delays have become some of the most common criticisms of the program. These challenges point toward the need for a more direct solution. Ideally, humanity requires a way to go straight to the moon without relying on a long chain of mission phases and transfers. Is such an approach realistic? Leaving aside fictional concepts borrowed from movies and comics, there is only one practical answer. It requires building a vehicle powerful enough to do the job in a single unified architecture. Interestingly, this idea is not new. During the early years of the space race, NASA studied a family of massive launch vehicles known as Nova. These rockets were designed to deliver extremely large payloads directly toward the moon. Nova shared some design similarities with Saturn V, but was intended to be significantly larger and more powerful. One of the most notable concepts was the Nova 8L. This design replaced Saturn V's five F1 engines with eight. That configuration would have generated approximately 5,520 tons of thrust at liftoff, enabling the rocket to deliver around 68 tons of payload directly to the moon. Other Nova variants explored even more ambitious ideas, including solid fuel upper stages and nuclear propulsion concepts, potentially increasing lunar payload capacity to roughly 75 tons. Ultimately, Nova was never built. NASA chose Saturn V and its multi-phase lunar orbit rendezvous architecture instead. Given the political, financial, and technological realities of the time, that decision was understandable. Today, however, the strategic landscape has changed. Speed, scale, and sustainability are now paramount, making the concept of a direct-to-the-moon super-heavy vehicle increasingly appealing. So which vehicle could realistically fulfill that role? At present, no candidate stands out more clearly than Starship. Starship is the largest and most powerful launch vehicle ever constructed. Its propulsion system continues to evolve at a rapid pace. After Raptor 2 achieved approximately 230 tons of thrust per engine, each SpaceX has set its sights on Raptor 3, targeting around 280 tons. Reports and internal discussions suggest that even more powerful versions, approaching 330 tons of thrust, may eventually follow. Individually, these engines still fall short of the historic F-1 engine, which produced about 690 tons of thrust. However, SpaceX's philosophy emphasizes numbers redundancy, and scalability rather than singular brute force. Starship is designed to accommodate many engines. With 33 Raptors, even the Raptor 2 configuration delivers roughly 7,590 tons of total thrust. Planned V3 upgrades are expected to push that figure to approximately 9,240 tons in 2026, while SpaceX has indicated that V4 could exceed 10,000 tons of thrust. For comparison, Saturn V produced about 3,450 tons of thrust at liftoff. Even the most ambitious Nova concepts would fall short of Starship's projected performance. Starship's advantage extends beyond the first stage. Its upper stage employs six Raptor vacuum engines, providing thrust levels that surpass those envisioned for Nova's upper stages. Raw power alone, however, is not enough. Payload capacity is just as critical, and here Starship excels. Nova was expected to deliver between 68 and 75 tons to the moon. Starship's future configurations target payload capacity of 100 to 200 tons to orbit while remaining reusable. In expendable mode, that number could even be higher. Although these figures represent orbital payload rather than direct lunar delivery, even a portion of that capacity sent toward the moon would rival or exceed Nova's original goals. This immense payload capability is Starship's defining strength. It allows for rapid construction of lunar infrastructure, delivery of heavy equipment, and support for long-term habitation. Smaller landers can contribute, sure, but they can't match the scale or efficiency. The lunar variant of Starship further enhances performance by removing components unnecessary necessary for Earth return, such as heat shielding. Reducing mass directly improves efficiency and increases payload margins. Taken together, these factors make Starship the most viable platform to revive the Nova concept in a modern form. However, achieving a true direct-to-moon mission without refueling would require major changes. First, SpaceX would need to rethink propellant allocation. Starship was designed with reuse in mind, which requires reserving fuel for both booster and ship landings. A direct lunar mission would likely abandon booster recovery entirely, prioritizing performance over reuse. In this scenario, Super Heavy would operate at maximum thrust to push the ship as far as possible. The upper stage would then continue direct 
directly toward the moon on a carefully planned trajectory. Even that may not be sufficient. One frequently discussed solution is to add side boosters, similar to Falcon Heavy. Attaching two additional Super Heavy boosters would dramatically increase thrust and propellant capacity. This configuration could provide enough energy for the ship to reach the moon without refueling. It would also eliminate the need for rapid launch cadences, orbital depots, and long-term cryogenic storage in space. The mission profile would be simpler and more direct with the ship reaching orbital velocity quicker before transitioning into a low energy tra trajectory toward the moon. Beyond the lower stages, upgrades could also be applied to the upper stage. One concept involves integrating a third stage within Starship's payload bay. This stage would activate only near the moon, providing additional thrust without altering Starship's primary propulsion system. It could function as both a spacecraft and a lander supporting crew descent. After completing its role, it could return the crew to Earth orbit, potentially relying on Dragon for final recovery if propellant is depleted. Meanwhile, Starship itself would retain enough fuel to land on the lunar surface. Once on the moon, cargo could be unloaded for support surface operations. With no remaining propellant for ascent, the vehicle could be repurposed as part of a permanent lunar base, providing pressurized volume, structural support, and shielding. Is this approach realistic? Is it the most efficient solution? These are open questions that merit serious discussion. What is undeniable is that Starship's flexibility allows it to adapt to almost any mission concept. In the renewed race with China, speed matters, but so does long-term sustainability. A direct-to-moon starship, often referred to as Nova Starship, represents one possible path that attempts to balance both objectives. Turning this idea into reality would be extraordinarily difficult. It would require rapid development, bold engineering decisions, and a willingness to depart from established plans. At the same time, challenges often create opportunity. Starship has the potential to deliver a genuine breakthrough. The the decisive question is whether SpaceX is willing to pursue such a radical transformation. For now, orbital refueling remains the most practical and likely approach. SpaceX plans to test this capability in the near future, and it'll be essential not only for lunar missions, but also for Mars and deeper space exploration. There is also an even more radical possibility. Some have suggested alternative propulsion systems, including nuclear-based solutions. Whether such systems are compatible with Starship is a question that requires care careful analysis. That discussion, however, belongs to another episode. And with that, folks, this has been Kevin with Great SpaceX. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already to stay up to date with yours truly on the latest milestones in SpaceX's journey. Thank you so much for watching, and always remember, curiosity, imagination, and inspiration will follow you so long as you keep looking up.